tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 15. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author Ilias Witherow, about unsettling attractions, perilous promotions, aerial anomalies, and villainous visitors. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight, from Elias Witherow, introduces us to a gentleman who has recently taken up abode in a new apartment. Outside his window, he's got a view of what at first appears to be an innocuous, ordinary part of the landscape, a small body of water. But he can't shake the feeling that there's something off about it. Without further ado, I present to you the Deer Pond. I lie in my bed, staring at my sliding glass door. It was late, probably well past midnight. I couldn't sleep. That seemed to be a recurring issue ever since I moved into my new apartment two weeks ago. It was a small studio apartment, a simple design, that fit my simple needs and pleasures. My bed was nestled into the corner of a small cranny, and when I lay on my side I could see out my glass door that looked out into a grassy field. I was on the first floor, a small concrete patio splaying out from the door to give way to a sprawling green lawn. In the middle of that field was a small pond. I'd taken a walk around the premises after I'd moved in and discovered the humble body of water. There were no trees around it, no vegetation. Groomed grass crept to the water's edge and encircled the edges, tickling the shallow, muddy bank. And now, as I tossed and turned in dark silence, I thought about that pond. I wanted to get up and close the curtains, sheltering my view from the pressing black outside, but didn't dare. Something was making my heart race, my mouth dry. I couldn't stop looking at the closed door. I could feel something out there. Or was it my imagination? I knew I was probably just jumping, my mind not accustomed to this new living space. Everything felt unfamiliar. Everything felt 
alien, like I was an intruder in someone else's home. Of course, that was ridiculous, but time hadn't brushed the feeling aside quite yet. Suddenly, my heart skipped a beat. Had I locked the door? Jesus, had I locked the door? I wanted to go check, my eyes never leaving the night-filled panes, but I felt like if I moved, something would come crashing through. You're acting crazy, my mind reasoned. You're a grown-ass man. Just get up and check to see if you lock the door. But I felt like something was waiting for me on the other side, veiled in black. I exhaled and tried to settle myself. My apartment was dead quiet. The pond. I could see it perfectly in my mind's eye, sitting amongst the giggling grass, their blades tickled by a night wind. Why did I keep thinking about that? Why did it fill me with such unease in these hidden hours? Go lock the door. Taking a deep breath, I pulled the covers off me and sat up. I froze, heart screeching to a halt. Did something just move outside? Was that footsteps? Had someone or, or something been watching me? Now you're just freaking out. Stop it. Hesitant, I slid my legs over the side of my bed and placed my feet on the soft carpet. A trickle of sweat ran down my back. There was no moon tonight, so I had to rely on my eyes to cut through the thick black. Something told me if I turned on a light, whatever was out there would react violently to the exposure. How old are you? There's no such thing as monsters. Swallowing, I stood up and went to the door, heart throwing itself against my chest. I reached it without incident and fumbled for the lock. Jesus, it had been open this whole time. I flipped the tab and heard the lock register. I stood there for a moment longer, my face inches from the glass. I could feel cool air radiating from the other side. There's something in that pond. The thought sent a shiver rocketing through me, and I turned and hurried back to the safety of my covers. I buried myself beneath their comforting embrace and turned my back to the door, trying to ignore my unexplainable fear. Why didn't you close the curtains? I grit my teeth, realizing my missed opportunity. Too late now, no way was I getting back up. I tried to calm my mind and focused on shutting my body down, forcing it into slumber. Click! My eyes snapped open, a shuddering breath excavating my lungs in a rush of sheer panic. Something had just unlocked the door. I immediately reached for the lamp on my nightstand and turned it on, spinning toward the noise. Nothing but night greeted me from the other side. I sat up, breathing hard, alarms blaring in my head. My heart raced around my chest like a wild animal, screaming. I searched for movement, for the source, anything. Still silence and unmoving shadow. Suddenly, the voice in my head began to yell, then scream. The pond, the pond, the pond, the pond! I jumped out of bed and raced to the door, practically slamming into it, as I desperately fumbled for the lock. Sure enough, it had been undone. I pulled the tab up once again, and I backed away, wondering if I should call the police. Something had just tried to get into my apartment, for Christ's sake. I backed away from the door, again picturing the small body of water resting out in the field, a few hundred feet from where I stood. I could almost smell the soiled water, Feel my feet sink into the mud on the bank. Taste the sour air on my tongue that hung over it. Suddenly my mind began to shriek once again. It's coming back! It's coming back! With a jolt I stumbled over myself in an effort to retreat from the door and fell backward, a cry rising from my throat. I waited, shaking on the floor like a child, for something, anything to happen. Nothing. 
Trembling, I pulled myself to my feet and decided it was time to call the police. I didn't care if they thought I was being ridiculous. I needed some peace of mind. As I turned to my bedside to retrieve my phone, it happened again. Click! Eyes bulging. I whipped towards the door, fully expecting to see a man or monster staring back at me from the other side. But it was empty. I raced back to the door and locked it a second time, and shaking and sweating. And that's when I saw it. Dim shapes in the grass, slowly worming against the earth away from the apartment complex, towards the field, towards the pond. What the hell's going on? My terrified mind screamed. Against my better judgment, I cupped my face against the glass and squinted. What I saw turned my stomach to rot. What I saw sliding across the lawn were people, residents, still asleep and being dragged towards the pond. Or were they dead? Gasping, I squinted against the glass even harder and saw figures. They were standing on two legs, their bodies dark in the night. They hobbled and strode across the grass like they were unaccustomed to land. I couldn't make out exact detail, but it looked like they had bone extruding and twisting out of their bodies like broken tree branches. And it was these figures that were dragging my neighbors across the grass toward the pond. Every ounce of me screamed to call for help to stop this insanity, but the horrific vision kept me glued to the glass. As the figures walked across the grass, still dragging their prey, I saw light begin to rise from the darkness. Beams of blue shot up from the earth around a central location, and I knew exactly where the source was. The light was coming from the pond. The beams cut through the air like luminous knives, slicing away the ebony air with brilliant claws. The tall figures reached the pond's edge, the light slashing across their horrific features, their squirming broken bones jutting from dark ribs to give way to almost dog-like heads. Their hands that gripped the still bodies were mangled and broken, with long bony fingers that sprouted like hardened fungi. I watched as my neighbors were thrown carelessly into the water, the splashes reaching my ears even from this distance. When the last one was discarded, the light began to glow even brighter. Simon Cobalt had accepted the bodies gratefully. And then, slowly, the twisted figures descended into the depths, walking deeper and deeper toward the center, until they were submerged and lost from sight. Do something! Do something! My mind howled, thrashing against my scalp. As I raised the phone in my hand to call 911, a noise filled the night, crashing against my apartment and drowning my ears with its intensity. It was the sound of heavy, urgent breathing. It was wet, a hungry pull of oxygen from soaking depths. In and out. In and out. <sighs> Over and over again, like it was around me, like it was in me, crushing all other senses to numb nothingness. And then something began to rise from the water, a dark, angry protrusion of black bone-like charred branches. Horns. I fled, not waiting to see what those horns were connected to. I tore my eyes from the horrific scene, and snatched up my car keys from the kitchen, and the heavy breathing never stopped, expanding into the night sky and stuffing my head with its insistence. I flung my front door open, the one leading to a long hallway that exited to the parking lot, and bolted for my car. I pulled up my phone and called the police, bursting from the building and jumping behind the wheel of my vehicle. In frantic, broken sentences, I explained to the emergency services what had just happened, what was happening, and told them to send police to the complex immediately. I hung up before they could press for my information. 
my screaming mind, unable to focus. As I tore down the road, the sound of the breathing began to fade, further and further, until nothing. The police told me later that week that nothing seemed out of the ordinary when they arrived. They told me that no one was missing, that everyone was in their beds, asleep and safe. There were no signs of forced entry, and no one had noticed anything, no one but me. I asked them if they had checked the pond. The police looked at one another and asked if I was talking about the deer pond. Reading my confused face, they explained that the pond I was so afraid of was a common watering hole for local deer. I told them that what I saw wasn't deer, but after I said it, I thought about those shapes, those protruding mangled bones. Just what exactly had I witnessed? The officers laughed and told me to go home and get some rest. I never returned to that apartment. Two weeks later, something shook the town, the event spilling out into the local news. I remember sitting in my hotel watching a news report on TV with white knuckles. A resident's family had come to visit them at my old apartment complex. But what they found wasn't their loved one. What they found was a dead deer, lying under the covers in their son's bed. When the police were called, they investigated the strange incident. What they found was an entire apartment complex filled with dozens of dead deer and not a single human person. Apparently, the deer had all suffocated, but it was all white noise to me because one question came soaring from my mind like a burning rocket. What had come out of the pond that night? And where the hell was it now? Otis here. I have a question for you. Are you a wine drinker? On occasion, I am, and the one thing that gets me a bit perturbed is when you don't finish the bottle, and it sits, maybe a bit too long, and loses its quality. Kind of aggravating, to say the least. Or worse yet, you pour it down the drain. Wouldn't it be nice if someone came up with an idea that would clear that up? Well, thanks to the good folks at usualwines.com, they have. And they have a special deal for first-timers. $8 off your first order using the discount code STORIES. Usualwines.com have wines for the modern drinker. Well, what's that, you ask? Simple. Each bottle is 6.3 ounces, a heavy pour, or about a glass and a half of wine. No more pouring wine down the sink when you don't want to finish the bottle. Because of the single-serve format and bottle design, Usual is always fresh. No more flat bubbly or stale rosé. Usual wines are made from world-class AVAs, American Viticultural Area, in California like Napa, Sonoma, and Santa Barbara, and are made with minimal intervention, zero sugar, and zero additives. On top of that, their wines are low-carb. But don't grapes contain sugar? To clarify... All usual wines are produced using natural, sustainable grapes harvested every fall. These grapes are picked at the optimal ripeness to ensure all sugar will be fermented completely until the wines are dry with no residual sugar. All that's left over is delicious, clean wine. Usual wines are fermented until no more sugars are in the wine. This ensures the wines are as dry as possible and lower in calories. We have a special holiday product, Usual Reserve. It's an ultra-premium, limited-edition Mount Viter Cabernet Sauvignon. Introducing Usual Reserve. This is our most special wine yet. Just in time for the holidays, hailing from one of the most celebrated plots of land in all of Napa. This Cabernet Sauvignon is concentrated and rich with just enough grip. Gift it to someone special or keep it all for yourself. The holidays, as usual. 
go check out their website at www.usualwines.com and use my discount code, STORIES, for $8 off your first order and try your first glass on us. That's www.usualwines.com. Then use the discount code STORIES. S-T-O-R-I-E-S. Tell them Otis and the crew at Scary Stories Told in the Dark sent you. And thank you for supporting us and our sponsors. I hope you enjoyed The Deer Pond, as written by Ilias Witherow and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first story and can't quite get enough of his brand of faith-shaking fiction, you can help support our featured author by picking up a copy of their latest book, a horror fantasy epic entitled Outlast Your Gods, available now on Amazon. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Elias. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Elias, spelled E-L-I-A-S. And you'll be redirected to Amazon, where you can explore the author's latest and his catalog of other books today. Also, as an Amazon associate, a portion of your purchase made using that URL is provided to us, as well as the author. Ilias' latest, Outlast Your Gods, was just released this past August. In it, you'll meet young Rowan. Lost in his head and dreaming of life, he fears he'll never have. Torn between chasing his own desires and pleasing his overbearing father, Rowan struggles to find a balance as he faces the challenges of growing up. When faced with the impossible, sometimes your only hope is to outlast your gods. Purchase your copy of Outlast Your Gods by Elias Witherow today at simplyscarypodcast.com slash Elias, and you won't be sorry you did. Plus, when you do, be sure to leave a five-star review and a kind word on Amazon, and let the author know you heard about him here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, again courtesy of Elias Witherow. And I'm going to warn you right now, this tale is not for the faint of heart. It's quite possibly one of the most disturbing tales I have ever performed in my many years of telling dark and scary stories. That said, it's also one of the best written pieces I've ever had the pleasure of bringing to life. So, if you decide to proceed, don't blame me if you have nightmares, or can never look at a barnyard animal the same way again. You have been warned. In the tale, a gentleman and his family are excited to share in his triumph, a promotion to a prestigious position within his organization. After a grueling climb up the ladder, he's finally going to receive his well-deserved reward, on a night to remember, without further ado, I present to you The Goat Room. My phone buzzed in my pocket. I reached for it, only half listening to the sales meeting I was in. My boss was rattling on, stressing about how we need to push numbers, increase our revenue, the usual slog. The other eight salesmen around the table looked as bored as I did, staring with half-lidded eyes, mouths slightly ajar. We'd heard the same pitch every year, and honestly, we were tired of it. If someone was dead set against buying, there was literally nothing we could do about it. I loosened my tie and checked my phone under the table. The number was blocked. My heart skeeped a bit. Could this be... It was a text. It read, Congratulations, you've been accepted. I wanted to jump up and pump my fist into the air, excitement rising in my chest like lava from a volcano. I couldn't believe it. After all this time, I'd finally done it. 
After all my hard work and dedication, all those times I went the extra mile and thought no one noticed. It felt good to know it was all worth something. It felt great. The possibilities this would open up, the life it could lead to, it was everything I had ever wanted. I shot a glance at my boss at the head of the room, still rambling and pointing to a pie chart on his projector, and quickly sent a message back. When do I start? I placed the phone on my leg, drumming the tabletop, as I waited for an answer. I forced myself to breathe. I felt like I could burst for joy. I was tempted to give my co-workers the finger and walk out of the meeting, but resisted. I could stay professional about this. I wanted to call my wife and tell her the good news. She would be so proud of me. And the kids? Well, they heard what a hot shot their old man was about to become. I was so proud of myself. I was setting such a good example for my family. I was really doing this. And to think they picked me. I couldn't help but smile thinking about it. My phone buzzed again, and I quickly checked the reply text. We start tonight. Meet at Quincy office at 8 p.m. for orientation. Feel free to bring your family. And well done. I felt like I could die with excitement. Tonight? My guts bubbled, and I shifted in my seat. There was so much to think about, so much to prepare. I thought about what lay ahead of me, and worms worked their way into my stomach. I pulled up my wife's number and sent her a quick text, not being able to help myself. They chose me. Orientation is tonight at eight. You and the kids can come. So excited. The finality of it hit me then. Something about sharing the news with my wife made it real. This was really happening. I was going to do this. Our lives were about to change forever. I was about to lead my family into the next tier of class. I stood up suddenly, pocketing my phone. My boss and fellow salesman looked up at me. Eyebrows cocked. I looked around at their washed-out faces, almost feeling sympathy. How many of these poor saps would die at this job? How many of them had already settled into the monotony of what their lives had become? That's what separated me from them. I strove to do great things. I pushed myself and walked that extra mile. I had passions, fire in my chest. Do you want to say something, Thomas? I blanked at my boss, staring down the long table at his expectant face. Thomas? He called to me, finger hovering over the all-important pie chart. I looked around at everyone, a small smile planted on my lips. Uh, I snorted, shaking my head. Uh, I think I'm done here, guys. It's been a real pleasure, but, uh, I started laughing, not being able to hold it in any longer. But I got better things lined up. Take care now, you hear? And with that, I marched myself out the door and followed by shocked stares. When I got home, my wife met me at the door with a big hug and a sparkling smile. She told me she'd left work as soon as she got my message. She was beaming, ushering me inside and taking my coat, compliments bubbling from her lips. She told me she was so proud of me and all the hard work I'd put into this. She told me I was special, that she had always known I was, and finally other people had noticed. I asked her where the kids were, smiling myself, the excitement and rush still fueling my emotions. She told me they were at school, but she had called the principal and notified them that she needed to pull them early. They would be excited, too. I just knew they would. What should I wear tonight? Are we going to be there the whole orientation? Will they let us stay? She asked, running into the bedroom and pulling out dresses from the closet. I shrugged, grinning like an idiot. I don't know, hon. I guess we'll find out. 
she spun around, a small blue dress pressed to her frame, and said, "'How's this? Is this good?' "'Oh, Thomas, I'm just so happy I could burst.' She ran over to me giggling and kissed me, her arms around my neck. She looked up into my eyes, admiration shining from her own. "'Can I tell everyone?' I laughed. "'They'll all be at orientation. "'You can tell them then, before we start. "'You know how these things go. "'We've been to enough of them, right?' She smiled, a picture of beauty from ear to ear. I know, I know. It's it's just so wonderful. We picked up the kids together, my two boys, from their middle school. They climbed into the back seat, positively beaming that they had gotten a half day. I wanted to take them out, have some fun, celebrate. As my wife pulled the car out of the school parking lot, I leaned over my seat, grinning, and looked at my children. I bet you guys are wondering why you got to leave school early. I couldn't help but feel a little smug. They weren't going to believe this. They both shook their heads. Well, I said, folding my hands, your old dad is going to orientation tonight. I've been accepted. Isn't that great, kids? Both my son's mouths dropped in unison, followed shortly by whoops of excitement. I laughed and clapped my hands, enjoying their reaction to the news. Do we get to go? My eldest asked. I nodded. Sure do. All of you get to go. And guess what? It's tonight. Well, that did it. They screamed the hype just too much. I laughed until tears rolled down my face, watching with delight that rippled across their faces like shock waves. It's wonderful to have kids. Oftentimes they say or react in the ways adults aren't allowed. Finally, I raised my hands and told them to settle down, still wiping the tears from my eyes. I told them we were going to have a family day of fun to celebrate, and then after that, I was going to take them to dinner. More eruptions of joy followed, along with a few shouts of, This is the best day ever! and I chuckled again, asking them what they would like to do first. After some discussion and negotiation amongst my family, we decided that we were going to go to the movies. After that, it was off to our favorite burger joint for dinner and milkshakes. We spent the afternoon in the movie theater, slurping down overpriced soda and munching on stale popcorn. After the movie, I wiped butter from my kids' fingers and ushered them back to the car. Despite having consumed a barrel of popcorn, my sons moaned that they were starving. Having not eaten but a few kernels myself, I was glad to hear it. I checked my watch and saw that we had two hours before we had to be at the Quincy office. We drove across town, our ride filled with commentary about the movie we'd just seen. My sons loved it, my wife not so much. I argued with my oldest about some of the plot points, goading him a little bit just because I was in such a good mood. My wife shook her head, smiling to herself and enjoying the positive energy that sparked around us. Thirty minutes later, I pulled into the restaurant and parked. Already shouting out what they wanted to eat, the boys bounded from the car. I opened my door and got out, telling them to settle down. The burgers weren't going anywhere. As I watched my wife follow our kids, it hit me like a shotgun blast. You're going to the goat room tonight. I bent over, suddenly in need of air, and sucked in the evening sky. I blinked a few times, clearing my head, the realization crippling my mind. I pulled in another couple of breaths and chuckled. The gravity of the night before me was astounding. At that moment, I felt like the luckiest guy in the world. I looked up and saw my wife calling me, asking if I was okay. I straightened and gave her a thumbs up and a big smile. I walked to them at the front of the restaurant, taking in my surroundings, letting the setting sun cast its warm rays across my face. What a time to be alive. We got a booth and ordered our food. I got my usual buffalo burger, 
watching the day fade into night through the windows. We chomped through the patties, my kids devouring theirs with alarming speed, and I ordered us all a round of milkshakes, as promised. I didn't think they needed any more sugar buzzing through their systems, but what the heck, we were celebrating, weren't we? As I watched my youngest slurp down the last of his frothy treat, I wiped his face with a napkin and checked my watch. My eyes met my wife's, and I nodded to her. You ready? I paid the bill and herded my family back to the car. From the restaurant, it was only a ten-minute drive to the Quincy office. As the night blurred past the windows, I felt myself grow quiet. My wife seemed to notice and did her best to shush the kids. She knew I needed some serenity, the weight of the evening, approaching fast. She squeezed my arm and offered a smile. I returned it and focused on the road. I was grateful for her support, grateful for my wonderful family. You doing okay? She asked quietly. I nodded. Better than ever. This is just a big step for us, you know. It's a lot to take in. We pulled into the Quincy office, its many floors, towering above the parking lot. I found us a spot and noticed a few familiar faces already entering the building. The kids took notice as well and began to unbuckle and call out to their friends. I let them go, turning the car off and smiling as they raced to their buddies. The cool night air tickled my skin and I felt kind of euphoric. Ah, settle over me. As I got out of the car, I walked around to my wife, taking her hand in mind. As we walked inside, we waved to Parkers and Kleins, both of whom had just arrived. The interior of the building was air-conditioned, and I nodded my hello to the security guard at the front desk. My wife signed us in. She always insisted on being the one to sign us in, and we went to the elevator. There was already a small crowd gathered around them, all waiting to ascend. I spotted my kids excitedly talking to their friends, and I guess they were already spilling the news. Troy saw me and made his way over to us. He shook my hand and exclaimed, Thomas, I heard your kids talking. I heard you got the promotion. Is it true? My wife answered before I could, admiration lacing her words. It sure is, Troy. I always knew he'd get in one day. He's such a dedicated man. How could he not get in? I blushed as Troy slapped me on the back and congratulated me. He called his own family over and told them the news, earning me another round of thumbs up and courteous congrats. At that point, the news was spreading around the lobby, and I was suddenly assaulted by a barrage of handshakes and hugs from all of our friends and acquaintances. They all wished me luck, and I detected notes of jealousy from more than one of them. Finally, we piled into the elevators and pushed the button to take us to the top. The whole way up, I got slaps in the back and smiles, an endless stream of affirmation. It was a good feeling, a great feeling. I looked at my kids and saw their eyes glowing with respect for their old dad, I reached out and ruffled their hair. A ding announced our arrival at the top, and we poured out, the doors closing behind us to collect the next batch in the lobby. My shoes clicked on the marble floors, and I saw Kent and Bradley, both rocking beautiful gray suits, I might add, already waiting for everyone. They held up their hands, smiling and quieting everyone. White light illuminated the hallway, casting a glare off the floor that almost stung my eyes. I blinked and focused on what Kent was saying. All right, everyone, settle down, he announced with a grin. I know it's a big night tonight, but we've all done this before. You know the drill. Follow Bradley to the conference room, and we'll get started in just a little bit. He turned to me then. Except for you, Thomas. You come with me, and I'll start prepping you for orientation. When you feel like you're ready, we'll join the others in the conference room. I turned to my family and gave them all a big hug. I kissed my sons on the head and my wife on the lips. She beamed up at me and gave me a quick nod. 
Go get them. The tide of people flowed down the hall, led by Bradley, toward the conference room. I went the opposite way, led by Kent, who brought me to his office. A beautiful polished oak desk dominated the room, the walls lined with oil paintings nailed to dark wood. It was quite the contrast to the modern marble design of the hallway, and as the door shut behind me, I felt like I was in a different building. Kent waved for me to take a seat on the plump leather chair opposite the desk. With a contented sigh, he plopped himself down in front of his computer and leaned back, folding his hands on his chest. I took my seat across from him and licked my lips, feeling a little nervous. Are you nervous? Kent asked, grinning. I chuckled. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But that's a good thing, I think. I'm excited. Kent tapped the top of the desk. Glad to hear it. Now let's get down to business. I know you're aware of how the first part goes, correct? I'll take you to the conference room and swear you in. After that, you'll say a few words to everyone and maybe assure them of your dedication. After that, Bradley, I will escort you. Well, I think you know the rest. I nodded. Then I go to the goat room. Ken grunted. Yes. Then we go to the goat room. He leaned forward. Now, do you have any questions for me? I'm assuming you know what happens after you're sworn in, and we move you. It's a silly question. I'm well aware you understand, but it's something I have to ask. I understand, I said, and I only have one question. It's about my family. Kent cut me off with a curt slice of the hand. Worry not, Thomas. We've ensured a better life for not just yourself, but for them as well. The very fact that you're sitting here already has sealed that. Again, thank you, sir. We sat in silence for a moment, letting the words sink in. Then he stood up and ushered me to the door. You ready? Yes, sir. He led me out the door and down the hall, our footsteps echoing off the walls. I realized my palms were sweating, and I wiped them on my pants. Everything I had worked so hard for was finally coming to fruition. We entered a large room that was dimly lit. I looked to my left and saw the familiar stadium seating filled with shadowed faces, all excitedly watching me. Kent led me to a small table under a spotlight. As soon as we crossed the threshold of light, uproarious applause shook the room. I couldn't help but smile, staring out at the familiar faces. I felt like I was in a college classroom about to give some freshmen a lecture that would change their lives. Bradley was waiting for us by the table, clapping along with the rest of them. I squinted and saw my wife and kids in the front row, beaming from ear to ear. I gave them a little wave and centered myself behind the table with Kent and Bradley standing at either shoulder. They let the applause continue for a few moments before Kent raised his hands, quieting them. He walked around to the front of the table and began to speak. "'Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming.' Tonight marks the 32nd promotion. Tonight we honor our devoted friend, Thomas. Let's all give him a hearty congratulations for all his hard work and contributions. More applause spilled from the crowd, and I began to feel like a celebrity. The room eventually settled, and Kent turned to me, picking up a small black book from the table. He motioned for me to put my hand on it. I knew the drill. I had watched the thirty-two others go before through uh, the same ritual. I couldn't believe I was standing up here, no longer just an observer. I placed my hand on the book, already knowing the words that came next. Do you, Thomas James Martin, swear to uphold your position to the best of your abilities? Kent said loudly, his voice echoing into the now silent room. I do. Do you swear to give your life, if need be, in order to further our cause? I do. 
do you swear upon your faith and family that you will proceed with the purest intentions? I do. Kant then nodded, giving me a hidden wink, and passed the book over to Bradley, who took it, and motioned for me to place my hand on the cover again. Lastly, do you swear your loyalty and motivations are in accordance with our guidelines, and that you will see this through until you have completed your task? I do. He cleared his throat. Then, Thomas James Martin, I hereby congratulate you on your promotion. Thank you for all you've done thus far, and pray for your continued dedication through all you endure. Thank you, sir. I responded. Bradley glanced at Kent, and they both nodded. The book was lowered, and I was deafened by cheers and whistles. I smiled so hard, I thought I'd rip my face in half. I winked at my wife and waved a hand to the crowd. Bradley and Ken both shook my hand and offered more congratulations. Bradley motioned me forward, offering the floor to me so that I could address everyone. The room quieted as I licked my lips and prepared the words on my tongue. It is such an honor to be standing here tonight, I said, my voice strong and sure. I owe so much of this success to the patience and guidance of these two men right here. I pointed to Kent and Bradley, who nodded their thanks to me. I also want to thank my family, I continued, for their undying love. I want to thank you for all your kindness tonight. I promise not to let you down. I promise I will see this through to the very end if need be. I paused, scanning the room, slowly, taking it all in, meeting everyone's eyes. I love each and every one of you. I believe in what we do. I believe in you. I always have. And tonight, I ask that you believe in me. The crowd went wild. Kent and Bradley motioned for me. It was time to go. I waved to the people and exited the room to cheers and whistles. It was time. It was time to go to the goat room. I had a sack over my head, the fabric blocking my sight completely. Kent was silent as he drove the van out of the city. Bradley was driving another one that held my family. I remained quiet, unsure if it was appropriate to speak. I felt the road vibrating through the floor as we tracked through the night. This was it. No going back now. I swallowed and felt my heart skip a few beats. I don't know how long we drove. Uh, this was part of the promotion ceremony that I had never been allowed to see. I knew what we were doing, but I was clueless as to how long it would take to get there. I wiped my hands over my knees, scrubbing more sweat from them. I summoned the faces of my family. They probably had to be blinded as well. I smiled inwardly, imagining my kids with black bags over their heads. They were probably complaining, giving Bradley a hard time. Finally, after what felt like a few hours, I felt the van jerk to a halt, and my ears picked up the spray of gravel under the tires. "'We're here,' Kent announced, breaking the long silence. "'Give Bradley a moment. He's bringing your family inside now.' I sat in the darkness as the van idled. My stomach churned as nerves wormed their way through my intestines. I took a breath to steady myself. I was ready. Let's go, Kent finally said, pulling the cloth from my eyes. I rubbed my face, letting my vision adjust. We were at the end of a gravel road in the middle of an open field. In the far distance I saw woods swaying in the night sky. A large, single-story building stood before us, its plain, concrete walls bare of windows. Despite its sprawling size, I only saw one entrance. I glanced at Kent and saw he was looking hard at me. Are you ready to do this? I nodded. Of course. We exited the van, the small rocks crunching beneath my feet. 
A yellow moon hung fat in the sky like a infected boil and dark skin. I followed Kent up to the entrance, noticing a few more cars parked in front of the building, along with the van my family had come in. They were already inside, waiting for me. I wiped a hand across my face. Steady now. Kent pushed through the large black door, the entranceway lit by hanging fluorescents. I didn't see anyone, the interior as bare as the concrete walls that lined it. The air was musky, some long-forgotten odor rising from the ground. I wrinkled my nose and followed Kent down a long hall, our feet echoing across the bare concrete floors. The ceiling was high over our heads, lights hanging from it like dead bodies, motionless in the still air. "'Where is everyone?' I asked. "'Waiting for you,' Kent answered, without turning. We turned down another hallway and were stopped by two large double doors. They pulsed with red light, and I could hear sound from the other side. Candles illuminated the space, stuck into the walls like knives, hot wax running down the cement like dried semen. Kent turned to me. "'Here we go. Ready?' I nodded, pushing down my nerves. Kent pushed the doors open, and heat blasted across my face. The room before me was huge, circular in shape, its walls curving like a swollen stomach. A bright red light lit the space, shattering everything beneath it in an eerie glow. Seated along the far wall was the Word, his tall figure hidden by flowing red cloth that draped over his head, and ran down to pool on the floor. He didn't move under his garment, giving him a strange statue-like appearance. Seeing him sit upon his bone-white throne, I wondered what he looked like, the fabric revealing nothing but a gentle pull around the mouth when he breathed. Sitting to the left of him was my family, somber, but I could see a muffled excitement underneath their watchful eyes. Spanning out past my family were the rest of the executives. They sat in their perfectly pressed business suits, eyes trained on me as I stood in the door. It was the first time I had seen them, knew who they were, and a couple of the faces surprised me. The floor was covered with red markings, circles, and hard angles crisscrossing along the concrete. Candles littered the floor, rising from the ground like broken teeth. The air was heavy and thick, almost fog-like, the red light obscuring my vision slightly. I felt something prod my back, and I turned to see Kent motioning me forward. Hesitantly, I moved toward the middle of the room and stood before the word. I wondered where everyone else was, the prior thirty-two who had been promoted. I didn't see them anywhere. Perhaps they'd come later. My eyes circled the room, meeting the gaze of the higher-ups. I wasn't going to let them down. They'd see. Hello, dear Thomas, the word said, breaking the pregnant silence. His voice rolled across the space between us like a bulldozer. I bowed my head slightly, a sign of respect. I couldn't believe he was actually speaking to me. It was hard not to pop with pride. My children would one day tell stories of this night, every detail of the tale spooling out in front of me in real time. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you for your unwavering loyalty. It has not gone unnoticed, and tonight you will reap the rewards of your efforts and commitments to us. The word shifted slightly, the cloth covering his head wrinkling in the haze. The lack of any eye holes gave his appearance an almost eerie look, as if under that robe something inhuman dwelt. "'Thank you, sir,' I said, hoping it was okay to speak. He spread his arms, the red cloth swallowing his limbs. "'Let us begin, then.' A door opened to the right of me, one I hadn't noticed, and two huge men stepped into the room. They were stripped down to their waists, their faces covered with hoods, one white, the other black. Bulging muscles coiled across their shoulders, 
as they carried in a large chest, decorated with flakes of black and gold. They came and stood beside me, gently lowering the chest. When it was set, they turned to the word and waited for a signal. My legs felt weak, and I forced my knees to stop clacking together. This was what I had been waiting for. This is what it all came down to. I had talked the talk, and now I had to walk the walk. The word stood, the red gown rippling across his body like dripping gore, and spread his arms again. Thomas, you were born a man, and now must be reformed into the image of our Lord. Kneel and be baptized with the blood of our God, so that your blood may be one with his. The men with hoods pushed me to my knees, and I felt sweat bead along my forehead. It was suddenly excruciatingly hot in the room, the red light warming the air like fire. The ground was hard under my knees, my joints popping as I took my place, head raised and ready. The man with the white hood opened the chest and took something out. He came and stood behind me, cradling my head with his bicep as he placed something in my mouth. I took the funnel into my throat, holding it steady with my teeth. He reached back into the chest and pulled out a clear jug that sloshed with fresh goat's blood. I gripped the funnel harder with my teeth. The jug he had held had to be at least two liters, and it was filled to the brim. The man in the white hood took his place behind me and wrapped a meaty arm around my neck, holding me in place. My heart danced in my chest like a wild drum. Sweat trickled down my spine in anticipation. I could feel my kids watching me. The hooded man took the top off with his teeth and tipped the mouth of the jug into the funnel. Blood sloshed into my mouth, taking me by surprise. It was warmer than I had imagined. I closed my eyes as it streamed across my tongue, flowed down my throat, and filled my stomach. It tasted like burnt metal, the thick liquid coating my insides. More! 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 I began to sputter, opening my eyes and realizing I still had over half the jug to drink. My stomach felt distended, a bloated bubble of sick nausea. I began to cramp, and I had to fight my gag reflex as I ingested the blood, feeling it mix in my gut with bitter acid. The man tightened his grip around my neck as he felt my body tense. I fought to keep the liquid down. It felt like I was drowning. I forced my eyes shut again, my stomach howling, as it continued to fill. I hiccuped and burped, spraying red out of the side of my mouth. It was like the blood was rising back up in my throat, trying to escape. Please, I begged, don't throw up. Suddenly, my abdomen hitched, and I felt the contents of my stomach hurtle up my throat towards my mouth. The man holding me felt it, too, because he tightened his grip, locking my mouth shut around the funnel. He shoved a finger to block the hole, just as blood and half-digested buffalo burger rocketed into my mouth. With no exit, the mixture of bile and blood exploded out of my nostrils like gory fireworks. I choked and struggled to breathe, my nose burning with stomach acid. I squeezed my watering eyes shut and forced myself to swallow the vomit back down. My body screamed in protest and I let out another gooey burp, traces of stomach bile leaking from the corners of my mouth. Suddenly the funnel was removed, and I fell forwards onto my hands, gasping for air. I took a few steady breaths, dusting my body, wiping my mouth with the back of my hand. Tears leaked down my face from the revolt my body had put up. Well, I thought, the easy part is over. I crawled back to my knees, still sucking in the hot air, feeling my stomach gurgle. The word was sitting again, his figure motionless. Kent and Bradley were standing to his right, watching me with intensity. I looked toward my family, and my wife offered me a secret smile. My youngest gave me a small thumbs up. 
a grin plastered across his little face. The blood of the goat is now your own. The word boomed from his throne, for change starts on the inside, and from the inside one can change anything he desires. He motioned to the man in the black hood. Thomas, you have ingested his blood, filling your mind and heart with his warmth. Now reflect on these miracles as you transform into his image. I gritted my teeth as the man in the white hood held me still again. Black Hood reached into the chest, and I shut my eyes, preparing for the miracle. I felt my lips tremble, and I bit down on them. I needed to be strong. My family was watching. Black Hood grabbed my right arm and began sawing it off at the elbow. I screamed, eyes bulging as pain exploded like thunder. My arm convulsed as the muscles were severed from bone, the hacksaw chewing through my skin and spraying blood across my face. The corners of my vision blackened as the saw screeched across bone, sending lightning bolts of pain charging across my body. And then it was over. I fought to maintain consciousness, the agony unbearable. White Hood didn't release his grip. I watched through bloodshot eyes as Black Hood set the bloody hacksaw down and pulled a blowtorch from the chest. A blue tongue of flame poked from the spout as he brought it to my squirting stump and began to cauterize the open skin. I screamed even louder, the pain beyond anything I thought possible. Seconds later, I blacked out. When I came to, head pounding, and vision blurry, Black Hood was cutting my other arm off. After he sliced the last strip of skin from my new stump, my mind went dark again. The world swam, red-colored and air-hot. I was on my back, White Hood staring down at me. He gently slapped my face, rousing me from the nightmare darkness. I blinked at him and tried to speak, but the words died in my throat. White Hood looked up and told Black Hood to keep going, that I was okay. I wanted to see my wife's face. I wanted to tell her the pain would end soon. I knew it was going to be bad, but this was excruciating, far worse than I ever imagined. I tried to block it out, telling myself that it was almost over, that this is what I wanted. Black Hood began to saw my legs off, the blade spewing through my flesh just above the knees. I passed out in a torrent of misery and pain, my howls dying in the air. I coughed up a mouthful of mucus and blood as I regained consciousness. My body was a furnace of agony. Something itchy was covering my face. My vision was limited. Heat. My limbs felt funny. Someone was talking, a voice muffled by my dreamlike state. I wanted to throw up. My head felt like it had been stuffed with burning coals. I tried to climb to my hands and knees, blinking the darkness away, but something wasn't right, and I fell back down. I shook my head and felt hands grip me and gently pull me up. I shook my thundering head the black pulling away from my vision like a spider web. Metal hooves had been screwed into my elbows and knees. My body slumped and weak as I stood on all fours. The transformation was complete. I'd done it. The itchy mask covering my face must be the skin of a goat, my eyes now seeing out of the empty eye sockets. I felt my head was bare and guessed that they'd already shaved it, and implanted the horns in my skull with a hot knife. I steadied myself on my new limbs, my hooves clacking against the cement floor. My body shook with effort, my muscles weak and exhausted. I ground my teeth and forced myself to stay upright. I could feel the goat horns digging into my skull. The skin pulled over my face smelled like rot and scraped against my cheeks like sandpaper. The word stood, and I suddenly noticed 
but there were more people in the room than before. Well, people was a stretch. To the right of the word, for the thirty-two had come before me, the thirty-two who had gone through what I had, and failed. They shuffled where they were, heads held low to the ground, a herd of unworthy goats. Their hooves shot echoes across the walls, an array of once human beings just like I'd been, men, women, all with goat faces pulled over their own, horns jutting from their bare heads, downcast with shame. Leashes were tied to collars around their throats, the ends of which were held by Kent and Bradley. The word leaned forward on his throne, assessing the state I was in. White Hood and Black Hood were planted on either side of me, arms crossed. I stared straight ahead, doing my best to stay upright. "'Well done, Thomas,' the word said finally. A smattering of claps rounded the room, the execs in suits nodding their approval. My wife had tears running down her cheeks and a smile that shone like the sun. My kids were slapping their palms together in awe at my resolution. The word waited for the room to silence. When it calmed, his voice became deadly somber. The rest is up to you now. You know the words? I nodded, feeling the weight of my new horns pressing my chin to the floor. I worked my jaw so I could see properly out of the eye holes of the goat skin. Almost there, I thought. I've almost done it. The word leaned back on his throne, scanning the room with unseen eyes. This is it, my friends. Not a word will be spoken during this time. Thomas needs complete silence and total focus. I think we can afford him that. Yes? He turned his covered head to me. When you're ready. The two hoods backed away against the far wall, and the red light above us dimmed. I noticed now that the scarlet symbols beneath my hooves were glowing. Candle lined the edges to form a circle. I took my place at the center of the pentagram. I closed my eyes, concentrating my mind. I pushed all thoughts from my brain, emptying my head. I focused on breathing, on the heat that swirled around me. I saw the red light filtering through my eyelids and let it dance behind my eyes. Sweat and blood dripped off my new face and fell to the floor. My limbs screamed in their new form, but I silenced the tormented flesh. I drew in a long breath and then spoke, my voice strong and determined. Dear Father, Lord God of the goat, I come before you not as Thomas, but as one of your flock. I have cast aside my worldly form. I long to be one with you. I have consumed the holy blood. I have whittled my body to mirror your holy image. I am yours. My life, my love, my future, my suffering. I beg you to return to the earth and lead us into glorious paradise. We stand ready, humbled, and in awe of you. I have displayed my undying devotion to you and my desire to follow in your footsteps. I pray to you, please, return to us now and lead us into your kingdom. As the last of my plea left my mouth, the room shook slightly, and a soft cry went up from the bystanders. Their eyes went wide, and they looked around at one another, mouths agape, my heart pounded in my chest as the pentagram flared and blood began to seep from the edges. I couldn't believe it. This had never happened before. Not a single person had conjured any kind of reaction. The herd of human goats looked up at me with shock and awe, their eyes bulging under their masks. The word stood, his hands gripping the armrests of his throne as the floor quivered beneath us. The light flickered above, and a few of the candles went out, a sudden wind stirring the air. I shuffled my hooves on the floor, 
trying to keep upright as the quake continued, blood pooling from the symbols around me. Even through the pain, I felt a smile creep across my face. I always knew I could do it. My wife had her arms around our boys, a look of utter amazement plastered to her face. And then commotion ceased. The ground solidified beneath me, and the red light stopped flickering, returning to its constant warm glow. The dust froze in the air, and then gently wafted back to the ground, the wind leaving as quickly as it had come. I watched in horror as the pentagram sucked the blood back into its borders, and the glow faded, and we were left in silence. No! No, we were so close! The word roared suddenly. What did we do wrong? What did we do? The execs cast their eyes to the ground, devastating disappointment leaking from every face. Kent and Bradley shook their heads at me, frowns pulling their mouths to the floor. We were so close! The word continued to scream. We thought this was the one! What did we do wrong? Kent raised his hands defensively. Sir, we followed the bloodline down to him. We were sure it was the right line. We narrowed it down so much, it has to be him. The word waved a hand at me from under his robe. I'm disgusted by the sight of you. Someone get him out of my sight. Put him in the pens out back with the rest of them. No, I shouted suddenly. No, let me try again. I can do this. I know I can. Please. Black Hood was grabbing me, dragging me back and away from the word, growling to shut up. I felt something clasp around my throat. I was suddenly jerked forward. I had been leashed. No, no. Please, just give me another chance. I'm the one. I know I'm the one. I can do this. Black Hood kicked me into line along with the rest of the goats. They were streaming out the side door, pulled along by their own leashes as White Hood led him out of the goat room. Just as I was about to be pushed through the door, the word turned to me, an arm raised. Wait a moment. We weren't wrong. We had the right bloodline. He turned to my eldest son. Just the wrong person. I thrashed against my leash, screaming, No, he's not ready for this. He's not ready for this. Get your hands off my son. I hope you enjoyed The Goat Room by author Elias Witherow, as performed by yours truly. Well, as much as anyone can, enjoy such a demented, disturbing piece of fiction. And I say that as a compliment. Hats off to the author, who's found a way to disgust even a battle-tested storyteller such as myself. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has an amazing selection of stories for sale on Amazon.com, including collections of his short tales, as well as several longer works. Earlier we mentioned Elias's latest, Outlast Your Gods. But before we go, I'd like to also uh, personally recommend this thrilling dystopian sci-fi novel, Final Sky, released this past January. In Final Sky, you'll visit a dying world, in which a mysterious disease known as rock flesh is rapidly spreading throughout the lands, turning men into monsters. Humanity seeks answers in an existence that's barely surviving. At the base of such mysteries lies the chain, a massive construct that holds the world suspended above the void. What caused the disease known as rock flesh? And what's really up there? past the chain, beyond the rolling ceiling of cloud. There's only one way to find out, by picking up a copy of Final Sky by Ilias Withero today from Amazon, in either the paperback or Kindle editions. 
Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Elias, spelled E-L-I-A-S. Once more, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash Elias, and you'll be redirected to Amazon, where you can get started giving yourself the creeps today. And again, if you give any of Elias's work a try, please leave him a quality review and a kind word, and be sure to let him know that you heard about him here on this program and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. You can learn more about him by following him on Facebook, Twitter, or Reddit. Just search for him by name, Elias Withero. I'd also like to take a moment to thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Story Time, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program 
each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.